Okay, so just as kind of a review of what we were talking about a minute ago, and that is let each moment be its own moment without being compared to moments in the past or moments in the future. Mm -hmm. That very comparison is what we're beginning to get out of, which is, which is also known as judgment, judging everything having a judgmental mind. In fact, it, it's quite notable, and I don't think that I've ever told you this story before. Stop me if I have, and that's the story of Adam and Eve. Now, the story of Adam and Eve is in the Bible, but almost everyone who reads the Bible from the Bible's, let us say, the Western view of it, misses what is clearly obvious to the Asian reader, that is, that this story has a moral to it. And the moral of the story is not getting kicked out of paradise by something outside. It's the fact that the paradise is destroyed from within the mind of Adam and Eve. And how they do that is by judging it. That's the whole point is they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. When they were in paradise, they didn't make those distinctions. Paradise is just paradise. Here it is. It is marvelous. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about judging it and then eating the fruit of those judgments, this is when we start dividing and conquering and saying, I like this part of paradise, but I don't like that. And yeah continue yeah. doing that we keep cutting everything into half and then into half again and then into half and you know what it's like you've heard the story about taking one grain of rice and putting it on the checkerboard on the first square and then doubling it every time i don't think i've heard that yes and it winds up being there's not enough rice in the world and never has been to go all the way to that 64th square mm. <laughs> the 64th is a really really big number okay yeah. So in one day, if you cut your joy in half by comparing it with something else, you're left at the end of the day of some incredibly small amount of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is the way that we have to do. We have to stop making the judgments about whether things are right or wrong, good or bad, up or down. And the rest, best place to start doing that is right in the moment mm -hmm. that in fact you could see now that as i speak about this comparing this joy with last time's joy is actually a hindrance to experiencing this joy yeah okay now what you're doing is automatic yeah it is <laughs> and everyone does it automatically and part of my job is to point that out and say, look at what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, yeah. I, I was not seeing that, but yes, that's, I do that a lot, I guess. Compare my meditation practices and my sits to past ones. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll always find some reason or another that this one's crummy in some way. Yeah, I do that a lot. <laughs> so. And you rob yourself of the joy of this one's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good to hear. And so instead, the idea is, is to, in, in fact, what you just did is exactly the right practice. And that is, is that we get an aha moment out of that. Mm. That as I tell you, you can see that you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. And so now you can be on guard for that every time that you go through this cycle to give yourself the joy. You can say, aha, look at that. I'm comparing this one to, and, and then you can get a second boost out of the joy right then and there. Aha, I caught you doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, okay. So, um, it is a actually a fairly basic teaching of the Buddha 
But what made the Buddha's actual teaching of it so marvelous was that he brought it into a system uh, um, that is a complete understanding of the process that the student has to go through. But that the process that the student has to go through is a very easy process. It's very clearly laid out. And we would even go so far as to say that correct practice is the only thing that's needed. You don't need to hear the first word of Dhamma. Mm. All you need to know is how to correct correctly practice. But most students are not going to do that just by hearing the very basics. And that, uh, uh, in fact, the Dhamma can be taught, the whole show can be taught very quickly. That happened today. I was working with a man, not giving you too much information, but he was, he was not on the verge of suicide. He was on the verge of giving himself a heart attack. Ah. Uh. It was that kind of suicide. And this happens to men who are uh, just after their retirement and they lose all purpose and meaning of life. They've got no more friends because all the friends they had were at work. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that I taught him was is that he needs to go do something. And in, in, in this case, most specifically, because he and his family are changing house locations, he's partly worried about the mortgage. He's partly worried about the, uh, the, the, the new place. And so I've given him the, 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 the orders to go to that new place every day for the next two weeks, or at least tomorrow, go spend an hour or two there and look around and introduce yourself to the people. Be a smile, mm -hmm. have yourself, allow yourself to enjoy exploring your new neighborhood. But then after that, we talked about it uh, in, in the sense, and he was actually quite willing to identify the problem that he was having in life. And because of that, I could go right to it because he could recognize that it wasn't the problems about thinking about the mortgage, nor was it the problem of it being a new place and all of that, that literally what it was is fear. Mm -hmm. And the fear was more important that he could think all the thoughts about what he's got to do in the new place and all of that kind of stuff without being afraid. And that wouldn't bother him at all. So it's not the thoughts that he was having that was making him afraid. Mm -hmm. It was the fear that was making him have the thoughts that he was having. Mm. And so we change that focus and recognizing that it's the fear that he has to work on. And so the solution to that fear is clearly obvious, easy to understand. And it can be explained in one minute, and then the rest of it doesn't take long. And that is, make a choice. Do you want to feel afraid, or do you want to feel happy? Your choice. Do you want to be happy, or do you want to be afraid? And naturally, just like you did, yeah, I'll take happy. I'll take it. <laughs> <Yeah. All> right. <laughs> All right. All right. So that's the whole practice. Yeah is to stop feeling bad and start feeling good. And one of the ways you make yourself feel bad is by comparing this feel good with the last feel good. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> uh, uh, that's good. <laughs> All right. So now that we know what the job is, we can also see that the way that the Buddha has laid out Anapanasati is that very little practice in great detail. And that one of the mm -hmm. details that's important to add to that is the issue of sati. All you have to do is to remember to look and see if you feel bad or afraid and then say, no, I'm not going to feel that way. I'm going to feel happy and joyful instead. Mm. And that in a nutshell is the entire teaching of the Buddha. Do you have the right attitude? Can you have the right effort? Can you remember to do this? Mm -hmm. All of the Eightfold Noble Path is built right into that whole little process. Yeah. And it can be said that if you see yourself feeling bad then, and you want to be happy, then dang it, be happy right now. <laughs> 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 uh.
I like how easy you make that sound. <laughs> it's it is so easy, believe me. <laughs> I've been practicing it for 40 years. Yeah. And, and I eventually got to hang up it. <laughs> yeah. I think it is easy. I, th I just think uh, most people don't know it's that easy, you know, <laughs> including I don't know it's that easy. Well, the entire society doesn't want it to be that easy. Mm -hmm. Nowhere will you find any support for how really easy it is. They want it to be hard because they want you to work hard so that they can exploit your labors. That's what the Industrial Revolution has been all about. And before that, the kings went and robbed, or the king's men went and robbed the farmers. Mm. It's all about you make what you've got and we'll take all of it and you won't notice. <laughs> and uh. they're basically taking everybody's soul that way. And the yeah. one thing is that because you're not happy and you don't know how to be, you'll find governments, you'll find businesses, you'll find educational institutions, and you'll find religions all having their own story. They mm -hmm. can be boiled down to some kind of bait and switch. Yeah. They present nobody, you like, they nobody present you with answer. Happen. Yeah, yeah. I see that. And so that's part of the society. We actually have to kind of give up on society. Mm -hmm. Recognize that, oh, I don't need society to feel good. It's my choice now. Basically, yeah. all I have to do is remember. Yeah. So kind of like renunciate society, like your materials like at least in this moment at uh -huh. least right now whenever thoughts of society come up in the sense of things that you want from society you can yeah. just say heck i don't need that right now yeah that that's not a condition i guess it's like it's not a condition for my being a certain way society that is yeah society has not been let us say it like this. It's not you that owes society. Society owes you, and it has not been keeping its part of the deal mm -hmm. and never intended to. Yeah. That's the bait part. And then the switch happens, and you never get what you paid for. And everybody engages society so that they can feel good about themselves and feel successful. That's the whole point about the marathon runner that wants to feel really successful. Mm -hmm. Guess what? He does not feel successful when he finds out that he just signed a contract that was not in his best interest. And now he's got a pedal Nikes, which you don't even like or something ridiculous. <laughs> so even that major win that he'll have and get that a gold medal in the championship of the um, uh, Olympics winds up being its own form of suffering as cause effect, cause effect catches up. But that initial win was what he was after so that he could feel really good about himself. Mm -hmm. And we, our whole society has been telling us that the only way for you to get feel really good about yourself is to have a whole lot of other people tell you that you should feel good about yourself. Yeah. Politicians, they suck off of that. They want to be told how wonderful they are. Huh, yeah. So when we recognize that you can tell yourself how wonderful you are, <laughs> then you, yeah. don't, you don't need to go out and do things so that you can hear other people tell you how wonderful you are. You already know that. Mm -hmm. You did an investigation and you gave yourself an A plus for I am a, an A plus human being. Aha. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I'm awesome. Wow. <laughs> yes, exactly. The job that needed to be done had been done. Yeah. What job was that? Change the fear into happiness. That's mm -hmm. the only job that you've ever had in your whole life. And you know that. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's why you went to school, and that's why you got diplomas, and that's why you got a job, and that's why you've been busted your butt. It's because you think that if you don't bust your butt, you'll get your butt busted. Yeah. So how about the um, samskaras, like the uh, the deeply um, ingrained fears that you've been conditioning for so long, you know, and that lets in you so now it rises when, up from the whenever bottom. they arise the question mm-hmm. is can you be aware of them how's your sati at mm-hmm. that point in time when they come up not okay, do yeah. they come up or will they come up but when they do come up because they will can yeah. you be on top of them can you kick it in the butt can you stomp on it can, can you hold it up and like a skull that you've just <laughs> severed from the body and <laughs> scream with joy look at this my fear my fear <laughs> has been decapitated <laughs> <laughs> at least this time <laughs> this year <laughs> okay so that's that's the attitude to have with it like just very playful with it huh when it when it presents Absolutely. itself Yes. Yeah. Very playful, very happy. Mm-hmm. Same thing with anger, too. When yeah. you get angry, you know that you're angry. The first thing to do is to shut your mouth. And the second <laughs> thing to do is to take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, was doing thought, that. I see you. I see you. I yeah. see this anger. And then you become a champion of the anger and you change the way you feel. That's the whole secret to it. That's the thing that's so amazing, in fact. Mm-hmm. Because most people say they and they recognize that they are a slave to their feelings and they have no opportunity or chance to change their feelings. And that's not true at all. What we fail to do is to see them as they arise. Mm. And once we can see them as they arise, then we can do something about it easily. In a way that is almost easier to spank an infant than it is to put down a 500-pound gorilla. (laughs) And that (laughs) infant will grow into a 500-pound gorilla in about 10 seconds. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. How about when it is? It comes up as a 500-pound gorilla, though, is it? Then you can start laughing at it. Yeah. You say, wow, I see you now. Wow, what have I been waiting on? (laughs) (laughs) Where did you come from? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Always in the same way. Playful, joyful, happy. Every time we see this stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. And you know that I've explained it in so many technical details within the, the teaching of it, of Petitra Samupada and, and uh, uh, Anapanasati and Step 10 of Flattening the Mind and Step 6 of Pitti and Step 7 of Rapture and all of that kind of stuff can all be bundled together in just one little thing. And that is just that when you see that stuff happening, take over. Mm-hmm. Now, here's a kind of an example of what's going on. And that is is that the verbal part of the mind, that which we have language and communication, can be uh, thought of as being the mammalian part of the brain. It's also our society and our um, territorial and nesting instincts come out of that part. And it's also the part that does the talking in the thinking. And then you have the more reptilian part of the brain, which is what it it thinks in a different language. The language it thinks in is the language of fear. Mm -hmm. And so this is the primary part. This is what we would call the self-preservation instinct. And the job of this reptilian brain is to be on guard for dangerous stuff. And it happens automatically. Mm -hmm. And so basically what happens is, is that the energy or effort between the talking brain and the feeling part of the brain get into a communication with each other that's almost like a war. Mm. And meanwhile, the weak, uh, under-trained human part of the brain can see this stuff going on. It doesn't have a clue about what to do about it. 
Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is, is that we're getting that front part of the part of the brain strong. We're yeah. getting it strong. Yeah. We're exercising it. We're giving it oxygen. It's making a look. It's having a good look see to what's going on because naturally the frontal cortex is actually stronger mm -hmm. than either the uh, the verbal or uh, the reptilian part of the brain. But it's only stronger when it is strong, and most of the time it's weak. Yeah. And therefore, people live their lives on automatic pilot. Yeah. A good example of that would be the Republicans in the in the United States. They're all lizard brains. <laughs> they ought to call it the reptilian brain party rather than the Republican <laughs> party. <laughs> And, and Trump really knows how to stir them up and get them all feel it and hot under the collar and mostly yeah. afraid mm -hmm. and feeds their fear. Yeah. But it's not just Trump feeding that fear. Every company that makes money mm -hmm. uses that same stuff to make people buy their products. Cosmetics. Yeah. Is a big one. Because at the bottom of it, I'll never be loved if I'm not beautiful. Let me go buy a whole bunch of makeup. Mm -hmm. And so really deep stuff about whether I'm going to even survive or not is predicated on a company selling makeup. Yep. So when we recognize at that level, we say, wait a minute. I do not need that world. In fact, that world really does suck. And that's when we come to that final conclusion is oh, boundless joy to find at last there is no happiness in that world. But in the beginning, many students have to recognize that and then they don't like it. They say, oh, boundless joy. No, they don't say oh, boundless joy. They just say the world sucks and they really don't like the fact that it sucks because they've been putting all their hopes into that world. And now they're recognizing it ain't gonna pay off. You're not gonna get what you want from that world. <laughs> Poor little you, oh, get disappointed and all depressed and everything because you are not gonna get what you want. <laughs> not out there. <laughs> <laughs> but if we've got a good practice and that practice can take us out of the bad feelings that we had originally, that we wanted to get fixed by the outside world and recognize we're not going to get those things fixed by the outside world, we could fix things ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in another way, these are the two qualities of the doubt. We talk about doubt as a hindrance mm -hmm. and it's normally kind of listed, but very few people really take a look at it. It's actually got two components. The first component is, whose fault is this mess anyway? Whose mess is this? If this is suffering, who did it? Who can I blame? This must be my mommy's fault. She gave me a spanking when I was four years old, and I've been an asshole ever since. <laughs> Not looking at the fact that, oh, no, you might have gotten that spanking from mommy because you were already an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and she just didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> so when we recognize that the, that the world is not going to help, nothing out there is going to help. But you can help your own mind. And all you have to do is remember that you can help your own mind. Mm -hmm. That's how simple and easy the entire teaching of the Buddha is. It's just that easy. Wow. You can feel the way that you want to if you can remember to do it. Mm -hmm. But since it's so hard to remember, does teachers like me give people practice sessions? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it is hard to, I mean, in meditation, it's way easier, but in daily life, like, do, what, what are good, like, 
practices to remember when you're walking around daily life and you know like there's so many triggers and stimuli out there all right let's do that if you think that you've got this wired for sitting practice then what we do is we do exactly the same thing when we're off the cushion mm -hmm. especially with the intention that to do it uh, on a regular basis so that that skill of sati to remember will happen so that when we need it most it will be there for us mm -hmm. in the sense that there's all kinds of good advice good advice everywhere sometimes even christians have good advice sometimes even uh, priests have good advice mm -hmm. <laughs> well sometimes lawyers have good advice <laughs> the problem is that people don't remember to take the good advice just when they need it most. Mm -hmm. When do they need it most? Well, this is actually a human version of Murphy's Law that the NASA and the engineers and all of that worked out. You know what Murphy's Law is? Yeah. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Or is That's that wrong? <laughs> That's only the first half. Oh. I don't know the other half, so. The other half is the important half. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and it'll go wrong at the worst possible moment. Uh, An example would be, when does the computer system fail in the new hotel? Does it fail on opening day, or does it wait until the hotel is full before the computer fails? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. You have yeah. to plan for extra workloads and things like that. So that's mm -hmm. the same thing exactly with Sati. The, the good advice that I give you, I mean, it's really excellent advice. Oh, don't be, ha don't be unhappy. All you have to do is remember to be happy and you can be happy. Mm -hmm. Easy, dead easy. Except that you can't remember to do that at sometimes the most important time that you need it most. Yeah. Like when you get angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you get all spiteful. Yeah. Somebody took your stuff. Getting robbed. You know, those are the moments when we need this joy a lot. Because it's automatic to feel like a victim. When we gotten hurt or trounced or robbed or beat up. <laughs> yelled at. And so we don't like it. So what we need to do is start practicing sati over and over and over and over again so that you could give yourself this sequence of events 50, 60, 70, 80 times a day. So mm. the question would be, um, actually, uh, there's, there's a kind of a plan, and I've looked at several different things, and the way that it looks like that is really effective. I'll introduce it by asking you a question. How many times do you sit down in a chair of any description during the day, whether it's sitting into a car or at work or on the couch at home? How many times do you sit down during the mm. day? Probably like 20, uh, uh, at least 20 times. Okay. And you could fairly sure, be sure that the number of times that you sit down on the chair and the number of times you get up from a chair is basically about the same every day. Uh, yeah, yeah. Depending it's on hard to sit down now. two times in a row without getting up once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. So what we're going to do to answer your question is we're going to do two different things. One's whenever you stand up. The other one is whenever you sit down. Now, whenever you stand up, what we're going to do is we're going to put a, a marker in there. Normally, when people get up, they get up with an intention and they get up from their sitting posture into an automatic walking posture. They just go from sitting to walking. What you're going to do is you're going to go from sitting to standing. Okay. Then from standing to walking, and that when you stand up, you're going to do it with the full, let us say, knowledge and investigation. And this is a wake up call. Mm -hmm. And the question that you're going to ask yourself is why? 
What's the intention? What's the purpose? Mm -hmm. There I was happily with this beautiful butt of mine sitting in that comfortable chair, and now I'm on my <laughs> feet. Why? <laughs> <laughs> What was it that was possibly so important that it got me off my ass? Because <laughs> 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 that's kind of important. What are your intentions? And so 20 or 30 times a day, you'll start investigating your intentions. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It yeah. may be something like to go take a leak. It may be something you like go see what's in the refrigerator. It may be like, oh, the dog is lying on his back, uh, having conniption fits and not able to breathe. And I got to go take care of it, you know. <laughs> Whatever it is, notice the intention. Mm -hmm. Now, many students say that, that uh, when they first start this practice, they've gotten five or ten steps in before they realize that, oh, wow, I was going to stand up and here I am already walking. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's awareness. That's sati. It's just a little late. Mm -hmm. But even then you can stop and you can say, what was my intention? Why did I get out of that chair? Where mm -hmm. am I going? And, uh, and sometimes we already have a plan of several items. So I'm going to go get a cup of coffee and, now I'm going, and then I'm going to go to the bathroom and then I'm going to put this book away and you know, so you have four or five things that you're going to do as you plan. Make sure that you note them mm -hmm. whenever you stand up and go and get out of the chair. Now, as a sidebar, you can also do exactly that same thing every time you open a door. Mm -hmm. If you have to take effort, like the effort to open a car door and then you sit down in the car. So a car is an opportunity to practice both sides of it because the door and the and the seat are so close. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, what we're talking about then is every door that you open, you open, you stand without opening it and ask your question, why am I opening this door? What's the purpose? What's the point? And so you begin to start investigating your intentions, recognizing, at least intellectually from my teachings of Paticca Samupada, that those intentions are actually what is called wanting, that I want something, and that wanting is based on feelings. I like it, I want it. Or I don't like this feeling in my gut and I want to get rid of it, and that's why I'm standing here getting ready to run to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but whatever it is, we begin to notice our liking and our not liking based upon our intention. And so that you will do every time you stand up. And after mm -hmm. about a week of this practice, you'll get pretty good at it. And by the end of the second week, you'll really begin to like it. Yeah. It becomes a good teacher. All right. Mm -hmm. Now for sitting down. Sitting down is also a major point, but it's going to be a whole lot more involved than just noting attention. Mm -hmm. Every time you sit down into a chair, it's very much like this is it. In the sense of when you sit in a chair, you take a load off. So you're also going to take a load off your mind. This mm -hmm. isn't a banner moment. This is full on. <sighs> Yeah. Okay, a full on happy moment, a full on wow, this is so nice. Mm -hmm. And you practice that every time you sit down to really take a load off the mind, really let it go, really enjoy the moment. And you keep practicing this over and over and over again throughout the day, and it will begin to take hold. Mm hmm. You see, if you just sit an hour a day, then that just means 23 hours a day. You're just stuck in the same old crap. It'll yeah. take a long time at an hour a day. But if mm -hmm. you do this throughout the day, you're interrupting those old patterns 30, 40, 50, 60 times. You'd be surprised at how quickly things begin to put together. Yeah. Cool. Now, the next thing is to start to watch your hands in general. 
we had already talked about the hand just a little bit with the issue of opening a door. But whenever you're grasping, slow it down. Um, here's an example. If my intention is to pick this tube up, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my hands sort of like this, almost in a playful dancing way before I touch it. When I touch it, I notice the first place that I touch it. And then as I'm holding it, I feel it and sense it in my fingers and my hands. Mm -hmm. This is part of what's going to help wake the hands up and get you into the here now of watching what your hands are doing. Yeah. And so whenever you're setting something down, you'll do it the same slow, methodical, easy way. And you open your hands. Touching and, and experience the last place that you touch. In that case, it was the thumb here. And then you redraw the hand so that mm -hmm. your hand movements become almost like a dance. Very graceful, very noble gestures. Yeah. yeah. And so these are things that you can begin to practice. Watch your hands. Number one thing, keep your hands away from your face. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't noticed you doing that, but a lot of students do. Well, they do I, this. I, yeah, I do that sometimes. So I, I try to, when I'm mindful of it, though, I'm like, I, I have the intention to not do that, you know? I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. What, do you know what, what's the tick? What's that a symbol of? Or what's, that, what's the problem with that? Yeah, lack of mindfulness. Yeah. And it shows that it's, in fact, the reptilian part of the brain actually is in charge of the hands. Oh, and that what we're doing with our exercises is, is that, oh, no, we, we know that the reptilian part of the brain is, is managing, operating, and doing everything with the hands. But now the frontal cortex is going to start ordering the reptilian part of the brain around, saying you're going to do the, the touching, reaching, grabbing, placing and that kind of stuff with under the control of the frontal cortex. He's now the new boss in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not going to do it the old way. That's just repetitive and just ordinary and just um, uh, habit done, habit bound. We're going to now doing in a new way that is intentional, purposeful, and quite joyful. Mm -hmm. As you begin to experience the touch of things. You'll also begin to not be uh, forgetful or unmindful of where you put things. If you start practicing this with your hands, you'll begin to remember where you put your keys and stuff. Oh, yeah, awesome. <laughs> That's big. <laughs> 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 yeah. So now we have kind of uh, several little things to work with. One is sitting down. One is standing up. The other one is opening a door. And then this last one is, whatever you can remember, start watching what your hands are doing. Mm. A lot of time, the hand will be on a mouse. Start watching how the hand moves that mouse. Yeah. So it's all about getting uh, to the, or utilizing the neocortex as much as possible throughout the day. Exactly. Exactly so. That's a really good way of saying it. Yeah. So, because even when we're activated in a reptilian, you're saying if we bring conscious control, we can uh, activate the cortex, the neocortex? Yes. That's okay. And, and you also breathing will activate the neocortex, conscious breathing. Yeah, not the reptilian deep breath. Taking the like deep that. breath, exactly. That, that starts activating and gives you the oxygen needed. Because this frontal cortex uses a whole lot more energy than the reptilian brain. Oh, yeah. Because it's a really small processor with really simple programming. Yeah, the re a reptilian is. It's Yeah, yeah but the frontal cortex, that's the big dude. That's our supercomputer, and he needs yeah. the juice. That's why it's easier to use when you have more energy, huh? like, you know, at the beginning of the day versus the end. Absolutely. Yeah. And it a lot has to do with breathing. If you keep getting enough oxygen through the day, then you'll have a better chance of keeping the mind sharp all day. 
Yeah. So that's another good. That's probably another good practice. Just do those deep breaths throughout the day when you remember them. Like every <sighs> at least now, every time you sit down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So okay, do that with that too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I've got something that uh, I need to do, and so I'm going to go do that. Uh, but I think this is a good session. You go do practice what we've been talking about today and call me in a few days and we'll talk, talk about yeah. it. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, right. you got any last questions? Uh, no, I don't think good. so. Good. Excellent. All right, yeah. Wayne, we see you later. All right. Bye, Domerato.